Father, your, your love is so amazing. It's what draws us to this place. It's what, what chases us to the ends of the earth. It's what reached out and grabbed us while we were still your enemy. It's what continues to draw and to woo and to transform. Every time, Lord, our, our selfishness, our, our self, we, we, we try to veer, we try to turn, Lord, there you are calling us back to you. Your love is amazing. We praise you this morning. May, may everything we do and say honor you, our God and our King, the one who holds all things together and made all things and continues uh, to bring order to it, the one who is king over our lives. May we bring honor to you, Father. We thank you this morning that, that as, we, as we come together, gathered by your love, not just in the name of, of, of love and of your love, but, but actually by your active pursuit of us, your love reaching out and drawing us to this place. God, we, we confess that we come uh, with so many things that, that weigh us down, that, that keep us, uh, that would distract us from, from giving you everything we have. Lord, the burdens of our life, or the sins that, that keep us thinking that, that we are, are too far from you, uh, to continue to, to receive your grace and your love. Lord, the, the, the pain and the hurt in our own lives and in those around us uh, that leave us asking and wondering where you're at and what you're doing. God, in this place at this time, would you just confirm in our hearts and in our spirits and among us as your people that you are here, that you are God, that you are active, that you love us. Would you help us, in light of all of the things that, that, are, that are going on in our lives and in this world, to turn our eyes to you and say, you are a king, and you have all of us. We offer our lives to you, and we say, Lord, would you have your way with us? And we pray this in Jesus' beautiful and matchless name. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, uh, I'll actually be reading from the NRSV this morning, for those of you who are accessing a, an online translation a, on your phone or something. From the NRSV. Do nothing. From selfish ambition or conceit, rather in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but each to the interests of the others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, would you help us to hear those words, and would you help them break into our lives so that they might transform us and make us your people? For, um, for a few years, I was really into Survivor. Anybody into Survivor? Ever watch it, enjoy it, like it at all? Hey. <laughs> okay, a couple of hands. Okay. Um, if you want to learn a ton about leadership, 
especially all of the worst forms of it. You should watch Survivor over and over again. One of my favorite leadership dynamics that always happens in the first weeks of this show is, is, is what I like to call the I'm way too smart to be the leader game that several play. If you've watched Survivor at all, uh, you know that the game has givens. Like life, death, and taxes. You know we're coming. And, and so the game of Survivor also has some givens. And these givens are certain to happen every time you, you watch the show. And here's how my first, or, or, or my favorite of them goes. You always know that one of three people is most likely to get voted off in the first week or the first couple weeks. The first person is the really annoying person. The person who just, nobody can stand, they got to get out of here, they're gone. The second person is the weakest member of the tribe. If, if you caused your tribe to lose a competition, you're out. But the third person, the third person who's most likely to get kicked off of Survivor in the first week is the person who has assumed some sort of leadership position. It just so happens that this person often tends to be the most annoying person as well. But the show starts, and, and everyone knows, every player knows, they don't want to be one of those three people. You know who these people are. You've watched the show if you're on it, and so you don't want to be them. And so in the earliest interviews, you see the same kinds of interviews, the, uh, people sitting there saying, my game plan, I'm just going to hide in the background. The last thing I want to do is lead this tribe. I'm here to win. And I know that taking leadership puts an X on your back. Or things like this. Well, the first person that you hear on the show say, I will never lead, will be doing exactly that just moments later. It, it, it happens a bunch of different ways that this person gets themselves into leadership. Sometimes the tribe just from the very beginning says, we need to pick somebody to, to, to lead us. And, and we'll follow them. They never follow them. Uh, but it's in these cases that the tribe says, we need to vote. And so they select a leader, and then they promptly vote them off. Or a second way that a tribe gets a leader is, is that there's like significant chaos and conflict. The tribe is bickering. They're losing competitions. And somebody just says, fine, how about this? I will lead. That person tends to be the one who just 10 minutes earlier said, I will never lead. And then the third way that a person gets into leadership is that they, they walk out of their interview, that interview where they just said, I will never lead, and they start barking orders. You, go get the water. You, start getting the, the shelter built up. No, 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 not like that. Let me show you how. My favorite thing about this is that every time uh, this leader, this leader gets, gets called on it. So somebody says, who named you our leader? And every time, eyes get big, it's like a deer in, in the headlights. Uh, I'm, I'm not the leader of the, I'm just trying to get us all settled. And, and so it goes. So here's what's fascinating about all of this to me. To win a game like Survivor, where your opponents, the people that you're playing against, uh, have to vote for you to win. You have to spend some amount of time looking to their interests, considering what might be important to them, what they might value. But that's not what you see at all. From, from some of these players who early on are grasping for leadership, Instead, what we see is we see a group of people who were so obsessed with themselves, their game plan, their position in the tribe, that they can't even pretend to be interested in others long enough uh, to benefit their immediate self-interest, which is winning the game of Survivor. I, I'll try to say it another way. If you're on Survivor, it is in your self-interest to win Survivor. Uh, to win that game, you have to pay attention to the interests of others if you want them to help you get to the end and win. 
But these players who immediately grasp for leadership, who, who have to take the lead, who have to exert their will and force their agenda on the tribe, who have to be in control, these players, their egos are so big that they cannot set aside themselves, take a back seat, knowing that in the end, it will be to their advantage. They have to be the star. They have to be seen. Uh, they, they can't think of anybody but themselves, even if it means they sacrifice winning the game, winning a million dollars. So, I'm glad that Survivor is, is just a game. Uh, it would be devastating, right, if we had these kinds of, of ego-driven leaders in important government positions making decisions on our behalf. Uh, how could we possibly stand it if the people lobbying our government were, were only interested in themselves and their own interests? I mean, could you imagine if we had these kinds of leaders running our corporations and our unions? <sighs> Thankfully, our churches are immune, uh, right? I mean, we don't have, never have had an issue with people grasping for power in the church. This, this form of leadership, this, the self-interested ego-driven leader uh, actually reminds me of a character from another television show. Uh, this character is known for his love of improvisation. Uh, in the show, he talks about how good he is at improv, and he talks about the classes that he attends to get better at improv. He is, he's good at it. Just ask him. He'll tell you. And it's in one episode that he highlights his, his classic or his trademark improv move. And he describes it in this way. It's the perfect move. Uh, it's universal. And, how, and it's perfect for any situation. It doesn't matter what's going on in the scene. No matter what anybody else is doing or what direction the scene is going, all I have to do is pull out a gun. And immediately, I'm in control of the situation of the scene. It's the perfect move. And I don't know how much improv you've seen, uh, but I have, I have a love and an appreciation for the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Brilliant. It's genius. But th th to me, that phrase, I'm in control, it, it seems to describe to me what the actors on Whose Line It Is Anyway are, are capable of. I, I, to me, when I watch that show, it's like no matter what the scene, no matter what the circumstances, they always seem to be in control of the story, able to direct it wherever they want to go. I mean, no matter how crazy the suggestion from the audience, th these improv actors, they're on top of it. And in funny ways, they make a good story out of it. But I learned this week something about improv. Um, I was watching Stephen Colbert's commencement address uh, f that he gave at Northwestern University. And at this point, you guys are probably beginning, this is the second time I've referenced a commen commencement address just this year. Uh, I do watch commencement addresses for fun. I am a huge nerd. It's all right. Um, I'm okay with that. But... Stephen Colbert, for a brief moment, shifts out of his comedy routine and begins to actually say something serious to these graduates. And he begins to tell them about something he learned when he graduated and went to a real improv school in Chicago. Anybody who has seen Stephen Colbert knows that he's actually one of the improv geniuses uh, in our day, in, in our world, uh, in our culture. Um, he's, he's brilliant, and he's gifted. But this is what he said, and I quote, there are very few rules to improv, but one of the things I was taught really early on is, is that you are not the most important person in the scene. Everybody else is. 
And if everybody else is more important than you are, you will naturally pay attention to them and serve them. The key, underlying, the best improv you've ever seen is that each actor approaches a scene committed to that truth. I am not the most important person in this scene. Which is why then another improv rule is always saying yes. Here's the way it works. If someone else in the scene has suggested you were a dog with a limp, you choose to pay attention to that suggestion. And you serve your co-actor by accepting the premise. You become a dog with a limp. And, and, and so uh, you immediately begin to limp and bark like a dog, which allows the scene to continue because you've accepted it and you're allowing it to expand and, and to move on. And it allows you to then uh, become what he has suggested. And you could go any number of directions at this point. You could lift your leg and say, you're a fire hydrant. And, and the story gets better and it gets funnier and... The only reason it happened is because you received your co-actor's suggestion to be more important than whatever ideas you had going on in that moment. You received them and you served your co-actor by going with it and allowing their story to unfold by becoming part of it. But think about what could have happened if, if it had gone the other way. Say, You think you're maybe kind of important, and so I should have speaking lines. So uh, I'm maybe a little bit too important to be an animal, or maybe you just want to be a cat. Whatever it is, your partner says, as part of the scene, starts to unfold, oh, look at the poor dog with a limp. And you just say, no, I'm not a dog. Worst improv scene ever, right? Where can the scene go? It's ended. The story is over. You could try to force a new story. Maybe you think you have a good idea, but how likely do you think your uh, partner on stage is going to be to receive your idea when you have just cut his off? Whatever potential the story had, it died the moment you refused to serve your partner by receiving their suggestion. You are not the most important person in the scene. Consider the gun again. Go back to the gun and what that does in a scene. Your partner and your partners, you're all on stage, are acting, and they're developing a scene, and all you need to do is go with it and serve it, serve them, but instead you pull out a gun, freeze. They all put up their hands, and you have taken control of the scene. You own it. It's yours. but you've stolen from your partners, from your co-actors. You've stolen from them the ability to create, to be creative, to contribute. You've stolen from them even the ability to participate because you had to dominate the story. You had to take control. You had to be the leader. If improv were survivor, the guy who pulls the gun is the first one voted out of improv class. Every time. He's the guy who's so obsessed with himself that he's just dangerous to have around. Jesus actually had some friends like that. This one time, uh, they were all traveling together and they were going through a town together. Uh, But the people in the town, they, they, they weren't really into Jesus or his message. But this wasn't the response that Jesus' friends were, were expecting. Uh... Do you know who we're with? They're asking. And and so Jesus' friends, not liking the direction of this story, ask Jesus to pull out the big guns. Should we drop fireballs on them? They ask. End of story. Shut this one down. But later, weirder things have begun to happen. 
a, a, an unexpected story that, that's been unfolding. And again, it's, it's not the story the disciples were really expecting or anticipating. They're not really feeling it today. And so, boom, Peter pulls out, it's not a gun, but a sword. Same idea. What does he do? He tries to take control of the situation. He tries to exert himself. He tries to say, story's over. But both of these stories have the same conclusion. And, and we quickly learned that, that Jesus, like Stephen Colbert, understands the art of improv, right? Rule number one, you are not the most important person in this scene. If you're Jesus, and you act as though you're not the most important person in this scene, then a city that rejects you isn't a big deal. Your ego isn't crushed because well, you don't have an ego. It, it isn't something to get angry about. It's to be expected. You are a nobody. Why would they respond to you? And so this is to be expected. And, and, and so what do you do? You receive their rejection and you move on. The story goes on. And, and if you were Jesus and you act as though you were not the most important person in the scene, then when a group of soldiers come to arrest you, you don't pull swords on them. You go with the story that they're telling. You go with them. You, you let the story unfold. You serve your captors. Look again at our passage this morning. If your Bible's open, there in chapter 2 of Philippians, verse 3, hear the instructions given to us, and then hear the way they are tied to the story of Jesus. Do nothing starting in verse 3, from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Stephen Colbert was, was quoting scripture in this speech. Improv rule number one, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Some of you may be curious why I chose to read from a different translation this morning of uh, if you have an older NIV, an, the ESV, or the NLT, your verse 4 probably sounds a little bit different. This is a hard verse. And to many, in, uh, especially in our highly individualistic, me-oriented culture, this verse sounds stupid and irresponsible. We ask the question, if I don't look at myself, if I don't look after myself, take care of myself, who will? I can't depend on others. And, and so as a result of how impossible it is not to look to your own interests, some English translations have been watered down. It, it's amazing what kind of meaning one word adds. But if you have the word only there in your text, you're, you're reading from the tame version. See, because the problem is the word only is not in the Greek. It's not in any ancient Greek version text that we have, which means it's been added by, by English translators who I'm sure with the best of intentions couldn't possibly believe that we are not to look to ourselves at all, which is what this passage seems to be saying. Don't look out for your own interests. Compare that to don't look out only for your own interests. Those are very two different statements. But the second one, it's, it's just way more in the American mode, right? I mean, we like to help. We are helpers. But after we've taken care of ourselves, we want to serve. But only if we have time after we've finished all of our stuff. And we have a deep belief that I, that I must take care of myself because if I don't, nobody else will. This is why some have come to think that this, this teaching is just irresponsible. Everyone knows that should cabin pressure drop, the mask and the masks fall from the overhead compartment, whose mask do you put on first? your own, before your children or anybody else. We all know this. These are the rules. 
To do otherwise is, is self-neglect. That is unless you have a church. That is unless you have a community of people called by Jesus saved and bound by Jesus, transformed by Jesus, who, who have begun to have the same mind as Jesus, who have adopted rule number one. I am not the most important person in this scene. If you have this kind of community, the rules have to change. Colbert describes how this works in improv, and he continues in his speech, if everybody else is more important than you, you will naturally pay attention to them and serve them. We heard that earlier. But, but, Colbert announces, the good news is you are in the scene too. So hopefully to them, you are the most important person in the scene, and they will serve you. How churchy this sounds. If this is the kind of community that the church is supposed to be, then this has some pretty dramatic implications for who we select for leadership among us. And, and this isn't just a one-time thing, but for all time. We are, we are looking for leaders with strong biases we are looking for leaders who, who, without shame, are deeply committed to others before themselves. Not if there's time left, money left, energy left. We're looking for leaders who, who have the same mind that was in Jesus the Messiah, who, who consistently acted as though People who consistently act as though they are less important than they may really be. And who have a strong prejudice toward the needs of others. But here's the thing. This passage that we're reading this morning isn't a leadership passage. It's important for us to understand this. This is not a passage about who our leaders are. It's general instruction for a local church. This kind of of selfless service, it, it's not a super trait of the spiritual elite among us. It, it's the very pattern of Jesus' life. And it's to be the very pattern of all of our lives. And so here, the previous instructions to think about others above yourself and to look to their interests bef before your own— uh, Listen to those, hear those, and, 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 and consider them as they're tied to this ancient hymn about Jesus that continues in Philippians, starting in verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Messiah Jesus, who, though he was in the very form, God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, grasped, some translations say. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and, and being found in human form. He humbled himself further and became obedient, even to death, even death on a cross, down down, down. Nature of God refused to grasp, emptied himself a slave, a human death, and even the ultimate humiliation of death on a cross, the ultimate act of selflessness. That one who is in the form of God would, would so completely give up himself, give of himself so that, that you might be set free from the power of evil, of death, of yourself. If you think that this is then something that you can accomplish on your own by reading this and saying, I'm just going to imitate it, um, we'd be mistaken. You cannot will yourself to have the mind of Jesus. See, this is something that he does. He does in you. 
but it's hard work and it's painful work, but it is something that you must receive. And not just once, but over and over again. See, when you are baptized, when you go under the water, which signifies dying to yourself, what you're doing is you're publicly announcing that this is going to be the pattern of your life for every day and moment that follows. You are choosing in that moment to, to begin a process, a pattern of dying to yourself in this moment and then in the next moment and then the next moment. So that each and every day and each and every one of these moments, the life of Jesus might be formed in you. If you think that this is something you can fake, you would be mistaken. Now some can fake it longer than others. But like the, the leaders that emerge uh, on the first episode of Survivor, they might present this this face of humility in their private interview and they might be able to to present it for a little while they might even be able to take a back seat and serve others for a little bit but but it's only a matter of time until the true self comes out the self that is concerned first and foremost with the self and that's when you will begin to try to take control Part of what's awkward about this whole thing for us is that the church has played a part in, in all of this. The, the church for a period of time has, has been acting as, as like an enabling parent for a while. Maybe so long that, that we don't realize that we're doing it. Kind of like the parent who encourages his kid to do all kinds of things that are beyond that kid's age and maturity, uh, but then gets upset when that kid is growing up too fast. We do the same kind of thing when, when the church, and when I say the church, I don't mean us, I mean, I mean the church, uh, tells followers of Jesus, you are not the most important person in the scene. But the church's message has been compromised by its actions. See, because every time, every time the church uses the self interests of people to at attract them, they say, or what we say is, it's not about you. Or sorry, it's about you. It's about you. It's about you. Oh, you've accepted Jesus now. Well, now it's no longer about you. Oh, that felt like a bait and switch. Uh, and you aren't interested anymore? Well, keep coming, and, and we'll keep pretending it's about you until you're ready. And so the church has been busy pretending that it's discipling selfless followers of Jesus who are becoming more like Jesus. But, it, but in fact, we keep telling people that following Jesus will make their lives better. Uh, that coming to church is good for you. The reading your Bible will give you more knowledge. That serving will make you feel better about yourself. That, that praying will give you more peace. But the truth is, we don't come to church because it's good for us. We come because there is a community that's been called by God, a community that needs us to be present, that needs our gifts, that needs our life. You, you read the Bible not because there might be something there for you to get out of it, but because there is a God who wants you to know him, who, who thinks that these ancient texts uh, might give you a decent start in that. And you pray. You pray. You talk to God. Uh, not because he's going to do something for you. Can you imagine how much that would suck if somebody wanted to talk to you only because there was something that they were looking to get out of that conversation, out of that relationship? We pray because in conversation with God, the self then is put into proper perspective and we, we learn who God is, which helps us learn that I am not the most important person in this scene. This is why the church desperately needs to identify those who, who truly have a bias toward the welfare of others. The church, from the beginning, has been doing what it can to point toward those ordinary people in, 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 its, in their midst 
who have been transformed by God's Spirit and who are daily serving Jesus and the interests of others, who are giving their lives for others. The church needs these examples. It, it needs reminders. We, this local congregation, this local community, we need examples and we need reminders. In the same letter that we find our passage this morning, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Paul gives examples. He gives two examples. Paul understands how badly the church needs to see and to name this kind of life being lived. And so he gives us pictures. Uh, starting in verse 19. We're not going to read them verse by verse, but, but these are the two examples. Starting in verse 19, he says to him, I hope to send Timothy to you soon. Some of you remember that name. Three weeks ago, we talked about Timothy, who's now leading a church. But here, uh, Paul says, I hope to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests not those of the Messiah, Jesus. What a powerful statement and testimony. Uh, for one thing, it, it should not surprise us when in a culture that's dominated by terrible, selfish, self-seeking, control, hungry leaders, that what would be produced are the same kinds of people. And so it shouldn't surprise us when there are few who actively seek the interests of Jesus and, uh, and of others. Um, but a second thing is that we should eagerly celebrate the work of God that's evident in this passage. The work of God that's able to transform a wretched, selfish, ego-driven sinner like Timothy into a cross-bearing servant who would seek the welfare of others before all else. Praise the Lord for God's work in Timothy's life. But, but Paul doesn't stop there. He, he adds Epaphroditus to his list of examples. And Epaphroditus was a messenger, a servant, who, as the story goes, he almost died because the conditions were so bad, uh, he got sick and almost died because of his service, his work for Jesus. Willing, obedient, even unto death. Epaphroditus stands as a second example for us. And, 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 and so here, here we are. It's the last Sunday for, for us um, as, a, as a congregation to, to submit nominations, which are essentially testimonies. Uh, that's, that's all they really are. Uh, for the church board, uh, Tuesday's the last day that we'll receive them. This is your chance to point out the work of God's Spirit among us. What do you see? Where do you see selfless bias toward others in our church? It's there. It's to be seen. These are important stories for us to hear. These are people that we should be encouraged to follow. But apart from the process of electing leaders, there's another call in this passage, and it's a call to each of us. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to receive the self-giving, selfless love of Jesus so that we might be set on a new path, a path where you and I as part of a community together, are able to say in one voice, I am not the most important person in this scene. You are. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Grace and peace.